Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I'm Char Nolan, one of the members of the instructional chef team here at Ruby, and it is great to be here with everyone. I have loved reviewing everyone's questions. I love reviewing your summaries. And um, to be honest, today my office looks a lot like show and tell because I have brought my kitchen upstairs to help answer some of the many questions that have been submitted. So I think we should just get right into it. Uh, first of all, I hope everybody's having a wonderful Tuesday wherever you are on the globe. And I hope that you are feeling joy. And when I was at the grocery store today, a gentleman was taking video of the frozen food section. And I said to him, why are you taking a video? And he said, because my wife sent me here for several things and the pandemic has caused me to come home with nothing many times. So I wanted to let you know that we're still really sensitive about the availability of some foods in your local grocery store or whatever. Anyway, let's get right into this. This is from Leon. And he says, I hear more often that nonstick pans leak carcinogenic residues of scratch surfaces into the food. So I decided to change my cooking equipment to steel. Stainless steel is a great alternative. When baking in these pans, etc., how can I prevent sticking without oil? Well, first, um, write down on your question list, I'm going to say to Google the trolley cart. And I get to work with the trolley cart when uh, I'm teaching in real life uh, at the Philadelphia Free Library. And all of the pots and pans are stainless steel. There's not one piece of Teflon anywhere. So to answer your question, Leon, everything that's old is new again. And this is a 65-year-old pot, a stainless steel Revere Ware copper bottom pot. It was my mom's. I use them religiously. They never fail me. And the workmanship of a pot that is this old, you can see that um, it's sort of tattered, and but I love using it. And it works beautifully. And remember that if you're using a skillet, you, doing the water mercury test is probably your best tool for understanding uh, if a pan is done. And um, just one other thing, because I often work with uh, an induction stove and I teach in the community and oftentimes I work with people who might live in underserved communities who don't have the, um, <clears throat> the ability to go out and buy a new set of pots and pans. So when you use an induction stove top, you have to make sure that it has that little induction, uh, oops, there we go, induction symbol on it so that it can cook on that little burner. So if you're going to use this kind of a pan, there are two best things to do. One of them is to only use a wooden spoon or spatula if you're turning your food or whatever. And then the other thing is to wash it by hand with a soft sponge. And you don't even really need to use any kind of an abrasive on it. And um, I have burned things occasionally in my life. And I do the vinegar and water soaking of a pan with a little bit of dish detergent. And then you take a dryer sheet, the things that you keep in your basement or wherever, to dry your clothes. And you leave it for about two hours. And then miraculously or magically, everything comes off so you don't have to scrape things. So taking care of your Teflon is important. If you don't have the resources to go out and get new pots and pans, be careful. And if it starts to shed, then you have to give it away because you don't want to be ingesting any of that DuPont invented um, Teflon. I live in Philadelphia, just maybe a half an hour from, from DuPont where it was invented. Lastly, um, these are ceramic. I don't love these, but these are another great alternative and things don't seem to stick. And then lastly, Leon, to answer your question about baking and sticking, the, I use parchment paper. Uh, I line a loaf pan, a nine by 12 sheet pan. Uh, sometimes you cut it to size. Do not use wax paper because using wax paper, um, 
gets very soggy. It can burn. So parchment paper is good. And my good friend Ann Essenstein reuses it. She flips it to the other side so it becomes cost effective. One more show and tell item. Um, they also make silicone little cupcake liners and things like that. And I'm a big fan of cooking with silicone. And um, these work very, very well also. And they're easy to clean. So you can have those on hand. So I think what brand, uh, oh, Leon, thank you so much for that question. It was great. What brand of nonstick skillets do you prefer? I don't think, Kathleen, I really have an answer to that question. But here's one thing I can tell you. Um, using a reputable brand that you know is always very helpful. And here's the real reason why. If you buy that pot or pan and something happens to it, it's very easy to call an 800 number or send an email and voice your complaint or your issue or concern. Concern sounds better than complaint. And more than likely, you will get a refund or you'll get a new pan. And um, when I was first married, my mom and dad gave uh, my husband and I a big set of Farberware pots, which I also still use. And about a year and a half after using them, I overboiled something in the bottom of the pan separated from the top. And I wrote a letter to Farberware and they sent me a new um, replacement. So a reputable brand is always best to wait for them to be on sale. Um, let's see what happened here. Uh, Diane A. Hello, Diane. Uh, are there any safe, non-toxic, non-stick pans on the market? You know what? Uh, I sh didn't bring one up, but a plain stainless steel is going to be the best way to go. Never cook. I don't cook with aluminum, and that's like a whole other, you know, old discussion. But um, stainless steel, I like um, Kefalon, which is, I believe, how you say it. It's a beautiful pan, and Cuisinart also makes a really good stainless steel. And the unit, uh, the no oil saute unit, is probably your introduction to learning best how to cook uh, without oil and uh, gaining confidence in developing that skill because it is a skill. And looky, 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 right from the heart of Philadelphia, we have a big hello from Chef Fran Costigan, um, whom I've known for many years. Um, and she's sharing with me that she has one of her mother-in-law's uh, saucepans just like mine and aside from it cooking beautifully it always conjures up really wonderful memories of being in the kitchen with my mom when I was uh, a little girl thanks friend that's a great uh, we'll have to talk pots and pans oh this is so funny hi Ida uh, Ida confesses that she is the messiest cook I feel like I'm dropping things on the floor, getting things all over me and constantly washing my hands. That's good. Washing your hands constantly is good. Are there any tips or protocols on how to be more organized in the kitchen? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, that mise en place will carry over into not just cooking your meal, but it sort of carries over into other areas of your kitchen. So first, I like wearing an apron. You know, if I'm cooking at home, I'll wear an apron. When I'm out uh, doing professional things, I wear a chef coat. And I find that. And then the, your mantra, Ida, really needs to be clean as you go. So rather than having, you know, things pile up in the sink or having your workspace become more and more confined because you keep dribbling things, um, around, you know, if you have finished using your rolling pin, for example, put it in the sink or wash it off very quickly. Um, so are there any tips or protocols for how to be more organized in the kitchen? Um, you know, when I was a student at Ruby, and I think some of you know that I finished Ruby about six or seven years ago, and I found the entire experience to really help in terms of developing organizational skills because um, you would look at assignments and then you would make a list of what you needed and then uh, you would go to the grocery store. And I did most of my shopping for my assignments at H Mart, uh, the largest Korean grocery store chain in the world. 
because they had everything that I needed and it was easy to get in and out of and I didn't have to, you know, I wasn't sort of like uh, consumed by the bright yellow Nabisco boxes that might have been in the grocery store. So make a list, clean as you go, wear an apron and maybe prioritize what your cooking tasks are so that you can stay on task. And if it makes you feel good, crossing it out with a check mark or you know putting a wiggle line through it but I, I want to let you know that you're not alone and um before i started ruby i was the cook with a mile high um sink full of dishes and i just find that cleaning as you go is the trick great question the next question is from andres and he is considering all considering all the conditions during this pandemic how do you create an effective meal plan and execute? This is a, another great question. So somewhere along the line, I forget where, maybe when I first became plant-based, I made a four-week rotation. And uh, that four-week rotation is pretty much a way of life right now. So sit down, uh, cook what you like, cook what's in season, uh, make things that you can freeze, um, you know, for example, um, you make some chili, the chili just doesn't go, doesn't always have to go with rice because you can create a potato bar, for example, that happens to have chili on it. And then you can add other things like, um, mango salsa, tomato salsa, whatever it is you like to put. So I, I like to, I call them cousin meals. They're one basic meal that you make. And then you can stretch other things. Uh, looking at the uh, seitan assignment, one of the questions we ask at the end of that is, what are other ways that you can use this dish? So for example, with the seitan, I see people making kebabs and I see people grinding it to put on a vegan pizza, or I see people making tacos out of it. So think of how you can take one basic meal and then make it into a cousin meal and serve it a week later by freezing it effectively in your freezer. You're not alone, Andres. Many people uh, have the same exact question. Thank you so much. This is from Lori G. I am teaching a plant-based cooking class, her first one in a commercial church kitchen with 12 children, ages 11 to 17. Looking at that age uh, group, um, that's uh, interesting and different. You might want to have the older kids help the younger kids so that uh, there isn't that age resentment of the 17-year-old wondering what they're doing with an 11-year-old in a class. Uh, you have 60 minutes from start to finish, not a lot of time. And where do I begin? How do I organize, choose recipes, and make it fun? Um, my answer always is teach what you know do something where the children can be involved. So for example, I'm thinking a fruit kebab and let them wash the fruit, cut the fruit, prepare the food so that they feel very invested in what they're doing. Because when children are invested in what they're doing, um, I don't know if you're gonna have access to a stove or whatever, but keep it simple and teach what you know and teach what you think the kids would like. If there's any way you can survey them beforehand, that's always very, very helpful. Very good question. Oh, and lastly, if you are going to be teaching, uh, <clears throat> and I don't know what uh, the uh, commercial church kitchen requires, but you um, may want to look into having uh, insurance, chef insurance. And the other thing is that you may want to look into taking the uh, serve safe exam so that you have that. I cannot go anywhere in the city of Philadelphia without first showing those two documents uh, when I um, teach. So something to think about. Good luck. Let me know how you make out. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. Um, teaching uh, children is one of the many things that I also do. So good question. Next question is from Kathy E. What tips do you have for storing or freezing things like fresh cilantro? fresh tarragon, et cetera. It can get pricey always buying fresh herbs. So this is a tip I learned from a wonderful, wonderful Philadelphia chef by the name of Margaret Quo. Uh, you can take uh, parchment paper, 
uh, let's say maybe, you know, a 12 by 12 piece and chop your herbs, let's say parsley, chop your herbs and then roll it up like a pinwheel, seal it, put it in a plastic bag. And then whenever you need to have some fresh parsley, you cut off part of the roll and you have fresh, beautiful, delicious herbs. The other thing that you can do is put them into an ice cube tray and freeze them with water and then let it uh, dilute. You'll still have the same delicious flavor. I use the Margaret Quo roll up a piece of uh, parchment paper. Uh, it's what I know and what I like the best. That's a great question. So this is from Tara Lynn. Hi, Tara Lynn. Um, you have grated many of my dishes. In fact, I did last night. And uh, this area behind me is where all the action happens. So this is where I do your assignments. Um, <clears throat> my question is about mustard. What do you do with it besides make dressings and marinades? How do you make your own? Interesting. Mustard is so easy to make. And you don't even have to go to a fancy schmancy store to get mustard seeds. I was at Walmart of all places the other day and Walmart sells two brands. They sell their own great value and they also sell McCormick. They have yellow, as you know, mustard cut. Mustard seeds come in three colors, yellow, brown, and black. Um, it's very easy to make Google mustard and um, you're good to go. I use mustard for everything. Um, I mix mustard with hummus to be my mayo. Um, I love it on sandwiches. Uh, a few months ago, I did a class for the plant-based nutritional support group in Michigan. Uh, if you're not a member of this group or you don't follow them, it's called PBSNG. Um, they do wonderful work, founded by a lovely man named Paul Chatlin, who had a serious um, myocardial infarction. He needed to have eight stents while he was being wheeled to the operating room table, he called Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn and Dr. Esselstyn said, let's work together. Fast forward to today and Paul is the healthiest person in the world, takes no meds, super, super healthy and was the recipient of prevent and reversing heart disease. So I did a class for Paul and I called it tofu alla nona. Nona is the Italian word for grandmother, and both of my Italian grandparents were chefs. And we use mustard for everything. So you make a marinade and uh, saute, uh, marinate your tofu and then bake it in this mustard, and it comes, comes out as a dreamy, dreamy dish um, with beans and greens, and it's totally delicious. So mustard has endless possibilities. Thanks for the question and keep up the good work. This is from Colette. Hi, Colette. Uh, my question is regarding cooked rice. I'm still a little unsure on the safety with regards to reheating, reusing after chilling without reheating, such as in salads. How long after cooking can it be left to cool before chilling? Well, you let it cool. Um, I use a finger test to make sure that there's no heat and then I just put it in the refrigerator. And I can't tell you how long that is. Um, the, you're asking me for a very technical question and I'm sure there is a very technical answer, but I'm not sure. But if you do freeze the rice, uh, remember to label your container as far as keeping it in your refrigerator. I always recommend to place it in the back of the refrigerator and it will last for five days. Hope that helps you. Uh, this is from Audi. Uh, after using a marinade, can it be frozen and then used again, or must it be boiled? Certainly. Ice cube trays, best way, small amounts. Uh, you can use that marinade uh, if you're sauteing. Let's say if you're using a no-oil saute for your mushrooms, uh, rather than using a wine or a stock, you've got that beautiful marinade to carry you all along the way. Thanks for the question. This is from Laura P. Are there any concerns that you can recommend either on, I'm sorry, any sources that you can recommend on Ruby's website or books uh, where you can find culinary terms? So Laura, uh, let me just, there's a, there we go. So Laura, before you, uh, before we got together, I 
rummage through some of my books. So first of all is um, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Jane and Ann Esselstyn. They have a fabulous glossary uh, in the beginning that talks about all kinds of really amazing terms. And um, this book by Fran Kosick, and she's got a fabulous glossary in here that's uh, specific to mostly baking, but also great kitchen terms. I know that the internet is easily available at our fingertips, but I think sometimes perusing through a book and taking notes is a very good idea. And what I like to use as my primary resource is this book called The, Vegeta the, Ver the Vegetarian Flavor Bible, Flavor Bible by Karen Page. And this book will tell you everything that you need to know. And when I was a student at Ruby, um, it had post-it notes all over it. So the other thing, let's think of a word. I don't know. If you want to know about no oil saute, put it in your search engine and you're going to, you know, get a quick, quick answer. I'm not a fan of Wikipedia. So go to a cooking resource. James Beard Foundation always has excellent information. And so does Ruby. So that was a great, great question. Um, yeah, I think that we, I think that we uh, answered that. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, Raina Babette, good afternoon. I have a recipe that calls for carrots sliced very thin. How do I do that? Well, first of all, you know that old joke, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. So uh, in terms of working with carrots, um, when I go to H Mart, I buy the biggest carrots that I can buy. And I bring them home and I wash them, of course. And then I cut the bottom a little flat so that it will stay stationary on my cutting board. And for your cutting board, Remember to, I find it very helpful if you take a dampened cloth and put it under your cutting board. It will prevent the cutting board from slipping, gives you a little bit more confidence. And then I make sure that my knives are sharpened and I practice, practice, practice. But in preparation for answering your question, this is a, I call it my Fisher Price mandolin. It's not really a Fisher Price mandolin, they're toy manufacturers, but I got it at, um, Home Goods. It was $1.99. It stays stationary and it makes super thin cuts. So if I'm making potato chips or carrot chips, this gives me the beautiful ribbon that I'm looking for. But keep practicing those knife skills because I find that, speaking for myself, good knife skills help you develop more confidence in the kitchen. So that was a great question. Thank you so much. All right. This is a no apology zone. Sorry, Chef Shar, this is not a question, but I know that this course is really wanting high quality photos of our cooking skills. So, the, so for other students that are joining the course, I'd like to recommend that you buy a ring light with a mobile attachment. Well, you know, when I was, a, I, I'm sounding like I'm telling fireside stories here, but when I was a student at Ruby, um, there was no such thing as an O-ring. And I took all of my photos out on my side porch, sometimes at 7 a.m. so I could capture the fresh sunlight, uh, often time in my pajamas and slippers so I could capture that picture. And one of the things that I want to say about your photos is that before you have even plated that dish, you have shopped for it, you have made your mise en place, you've made a beautiful dish, you have done everything that you need to do. So you become part of that dish, you know, become one with the camera. So I think that um, having a mobile light is great. I use this uh, for when we go out to eat. We don't go out to eat anymore because of, you know, COVID. But you clip it on your phone and uh, it lights up has three different levels. Uh, if I'm doing food photos uh, someplace and it's not totally bright, I carry this with me and you can see how it just clips onto your phone. And then I have this miniature one that I plug into my computer. And uh, this also helps greatly, but I'm gonna say that natural light 
uh, is uh, probably your best thing. That is a wonderful question. Um, I should also say that about, I don't know, about two years ago, I went back to school for a year to study social media marketing because I'm interested in social media. And I took a food photography class. And one of the big takeaways from the professor was um, natural light is always the best. But your suggestion of a portable O-ring light is a very, very good idea. Thanks for that question. Tara Lynn is back. Uh, can you share about managing social media accounts for plant-based influencers? I want to start a gluten-free vegan kitchen. Very nice. Where I can teach classes as well as sell my dishes and desserts. I know nothing about social media. Well, there's a lot in this question. I see two things. I see one, that you want to start a business and you want to develop clientele. And the other thing I see is that you're interested in learning about social media marketing. So I think first, Terlin, um, you might want to concentrate on developing your brand and what would make your gluten-free vegan kitchen different than someone else's. And in terms of social media, uh, we'll, we'll use Instagram as, uh, as an example. And by the way, TikTok today is the number one selling social media platform, more so than Facebook, more so than Twitter or Instagram. But I would suggest to start an account with, um, say, Instagram. Have a killer bio that has descriptive words that tell everyone who you are in the amount of characters that they let you do that in. And to start off, I would make a list of 10 influencers um, who you may know or 10 friends and ask them to ask 10 people to follow you so that you can quickly develop a base. Um, <clears throat> there are people who are micro influencers and um, Micro-influencers are people who have under 10,000 followers. However, they are still considered to be as influential as, I don't know, Cardi B or Nicki Minaj or whatever. Um, I can easily send you a couple of resources that you might find helpful to get started. I personally love social media. So for the accounts that I manage for plant-based influencers, um, I just have a ton of fun. It's fun to ferret information. It's fun to take photos for them and other things like that. So the joy that I see in your cooking is the joy that you want to also show on your social media. Hope I answered your question, Terrell. This is from Leanne. How do I learn to create my own recipes instead of always following a recipe? Um, you know, I think a lot of it is instinct and a lot of it is experience and what you know in flavors. In uh, the Vegetarian Flavor Bible, Karen discusses great ways to develop flavor profiles. Um, I know for myself, I used to cook with um, garlic and onion, garlic and onion, garlic and onion. And I thought there has to be more than life than garlic and onion. And coming to Ruby certainly helped me to develop that skill. So um Again, do what you like, and things will certainly and easily fall into place. Hope that was helpful to you. All right, this is from Carol H. Hello, Carol. I have an unopened bag of whole wheat pastry flour. I'd love to know where you stored it and what it was in. Um, should I refrigerate the flour now or wait until I open the bag? Thank you so much. Or should I say grazie? Well, I automatically just put them in the freezer. I don't even wait. I used to have cute jars for them and it didn't work so automatically in the freezer. And by the way, just one little tip since we're talking about food storage. I saw this on social media the other day. Well, actually two weeks ago. It said if you want your strawberries to last, put them into an airtight container. And these strawberries are two weeks old and they look as fresh as they did the day that I saw them. So 
I know flour and strawberry are two different things, but strawberries are not cheap. And if you want them to last, how beautiful do they look? Okay, they're two weeks old. All right. Got the jar at Marshall's. I know five people are going to want to know. I love Marshall's. Uh, anyway, Carol, I hope that that helps. I, I keep things in the freezer. Uh, you know, I always listen to Fran Costigan uh, about how she does things and store things. And I think I believe that I always hear her say in the freezer. And um, it's just much easier. This is from Donna M. Oh, hi, Donna. Um, Donna is a graduate. Uh, she does wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, I don't want to blow your horn here, Donna, but I do know that you are a fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and you're also a registered nurse, and I think that that's wonderful. So um, Donna wants to know, what are your favorite plant-based foods to batch cook? So sweet potatoes, white potatoes, rice, and beans. And um, I know that everyone in the world loves an Instapot. I gave mine away. I broke up with it. Every time I used it, I felt like I was landing a helicopter in a firestorm. Uh, I cook my beans in my rice cooker. I say to the beans, I hope you're not having an identity crisis rice cooker, but today we're cooking beans in you. So beans, rice, potatoes, I think are probably uh, the big four. And... Um, from, from that five pound bag of potatoes, you can make air fried potatoes, you can make mashed potatoes, you can have a potato bar, you can make scallop potatoes, and the list goes on and on and no one ever tires from potatoes. And you know, poor potatoes, they've gotten a bad rap over the years because everybody says that they're fattening, but the reality is if you're gonna stock it up with, you know, butter and all that stuff, uh, of course the potato is gonna lose its identity, so. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, Jalice J. Uh, what are your top three tips for creating recipes that are flavorful and nutritious? How do you create recipes to improve specific health conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease? Um, so to answer the question in part, um, if you have, if a person has lived on a standard American diet, it takes about 21 days for those flavor enhancements to change if you don't use them. So for example, um, and if any of you have ever read my uh, lemon assignment, I always talk about how the taste buds for lemon and salt are in the same area on your tongue. So if you want to layer a flavor beautifully, freshly squeezed lemon juice would always be my answer. Herbs and spices. And um, one last question, uh, one last answer rather, is that I think that most of us know that a teaspoon of salt, you know, La Morton stuff or whatever, sea salt, they're all the same. Salt is salt is salt. Um, a teaspoon has 2000 milligrams in it. And most medical associations are recommending that you do not take more than 1500 milligrams to 2000 milligrams of uh, sodium per day. So you've got that teaspoon of salt. If you have a teaspoon of soy sauce, or if you're gluten-free tamari, a teaspoon of that has 300 milligrams and gives you the same flavor buck for your dollar. So I would look into letting go of the salt and looking into the tamari or soy. There are new reduced models. I also want to say that if <clears throat> I once did a needs assessment for a program that I was doing in a low income neighborhood and um, there was a store brand of soy sauce and the first ingredient was sugar. So make sure that you read labels because if you might be diabetic and you're using that brand of soy sauce, the added sugar certainly isn't going to help you or, um, your diabetes in any way. Um, you know, whole food, plant-based, no oil. I recommend always, you'll hear me talk that um, this book, which is the um, sort of like complement to Dr. Esselstyn's original book, which was printed in 2009 by Avery, where Anne Esselstyn wrote some very basic recipes. These recipes are a little bit more enhanced, but I always see that this is a very, very good primer because there are a million ways to use K2 
kale, for example, without having it taste like, I think a lot of you on your assignments refer to it as, you know, being earthy, and it is earthy. But um, reading How Not to Die is another good thing by Michael Greger, but this and the Engine 2 books, I think, are a really good place to start. And the recipes are really easy to follow. And they don't have any complicated ingredients in them. So I hope that that helps. That was a terrific question. Thank you so much. Hey, Lori P. Hello, Chef Shar. I'd like to better understand the concepts of reducing and concentrating in cooking. Are those two terms synonyms or is there a different way between them? And how are they similar or different? What do you want to reduce and concentrate? That, that's my question. I mean, for example, um, I take a jar or a bottle of um, uh, over-the-counter um, balsamic vinegar and I make my own reduction and I just have a low, slow heat and make sure that no one is home because my, the people in my family don't like the aroma of cooking vinegar. But slow and low is probably the best answer. I would love to know specifically what you want to reduce, but a low, slow flame. Uh, and start out by making your own um, reduction. I think that there's an assignment uh, in Ruby where you get a popsicle and then you can measure, you know, in increments. And then when you develop a, um, shall we say, viscous or tenacious reduction, then you know that you're done. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Uh, this is from Hannah H. In the Plant Pro class, what could someone use as a soy and gluten-free substitute for Task 421 for tempeh? And you cannot also have mushrooms. So let's do the mushrooms first. In terms of the mushroom texture and moisture, you could use zucchini or eggplant. Both of those work very well. And um, you can use zucchini or yellow squash as well. Uh, and they'll cook pretty much the same as the mushrooms would. As for the tempeh question, uh, I'm gonna think about that, but I will tell you that um, we are in the throes of uh, adding a couple of things to the curriculum. And I just finished um, testing a gluten-free seitan, um, which I found delicious. Um, to say so myself, but I hope I, I'm going to um, uh, look into that. It seems like I've answered this question before, and it's a good one. And also uh, back to the soy uh, for Hannah H. Um, you might want to use, I believe, Bragg's. I believe Bragg's is soy free. Good afternoon. Oh, dear. Carol H., this might be a, a question for Fran, but let's go through it. I have an unopened bag of garbanzo bean flour with an expiration date of 8 15 21. Um, is it still good? And if so, for how long? I have some unbleached flour with an expiration date of 5 20 21. Good. Oh, gee, you know, I believe that my freezer can keep anything safe. So if they're in your freezer, uh, you know, freezer life is generally between three to four months. So put it in the freezer and make sure you use it. Or better than that, I would take that garbanzo bean flour and I would make some um, veggie burgers from it or I would make some hummus with it. You know, garbanzo bean flour makes a fabulous hummus. Just add water and spices and you're good to go. Um, hope that helps. This is from Elena S. Hello, I'm going to open, whoops, question just moved. I'm going to open the vegan, gluten-free, organic cafe bakery soon. Uh, what oven do you recommend for a bakery for a commercial kitchen? Um, I have worked in commercial kitchens. I only know uh, Bludget, B-L-O-D-G-E-T-T. Uh, you might want to ask that question to Chef Fran, uh, but I like using a bludget because you can see easily into the ovens and um, they work very, very well. So, Tammy. Hello, Tammy. I love learning about plant-based cooking. Anything I can learn is awesome. What is the best tip you can give to someone who loves this way of cooking and her significant other is a meat lover, a fat lover, and has heart issues now at the age of 55 years old? Well, 
I always like to suggest to people that having a movie night with forks over knives is always a very good idea because I think the, that film uh, helps to set the tone for the reality of, or the gravity, the seriousness of heart disease. Um, I'm not sure if you are cooking this way, and we've discussed this when I've done other live events, but start out by having a meatless Monday that absolutely only on Mondays, we're going to start eating, you know, meat free. This is the best thing that we can do for ourselves and our family, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I also think following uh, Engine 2, formerly known as Engine 2, now known as Go Plant Strong. Um, 55 is very young. Um, and I, I'll just add this one little note. Uh, my siblings think I'm a kook. And they always want to know when I'm going to start eating, you know, the things that mommy and daddy used to make. And I'm the second of four children. And I'm the only one who doesn't have heart disease, who doesn't have a thyroid problem. And I'm the only one who doesn't take medication. So there is so much um, benefit and truth in following a whole food plant-based diet. My other one thing is because my husband is a meat eater. I don't bring it into the house. I don't cook it. He's only allowed to use a certain pot or pan because I don't want him contaminating my beautiful Great Jones roasting pan or whatever. Um, but it's a family discussion night and it's a discussion that never ends and it can never be preachy. Hope that helps. Oh, hey, Julie Z. Thank you for recommending the blender spatula from Sula Tab in one of the recipe Q and A's. It is awesome. I have been looking for the quality for six months. Oh, gee, Julie, you know what? I forgot I was going to bring it up and show everyone because it is the best spatula. It's about 14 inches long. Am I right? And it gets every nook and cranny out of the bottom of your uh, high speed blender. So thanks for saying that. Um, I always have fun answering those questions. Uh, Heather wants to know, uh, can you or can you offer a vegan mayonnaise recipe? So Heather, I'm not the person. I didn't like mayo uh, in the standard American diet, and I still don't like mayo. But when I make, for example, the tuna list salad with the garbanzo beans, I make a mixture with uh, mustard, hummus, and lemon juice, and so that it has the same texture and consistency of uh, vegan mayo. Um, there are some, the, the cashew creme sauce that we offer uh, in the course is a very good recipe for people who are looking for that same sort of texture. Um, I try not to eat too many nuts, so the, my hummus mayo, I think, uh, works really well for me. Um, let me know if you go and find something that you like. Don't eat the commercial ones. I didn't say that. Um, this is from Teresa B. With plant-based eating, I found myself with an abundance of energy to spare lying awake past midnight. After having increased workout activity, sometimes I'm still restless. Is there a certain greens that should only be eaten before too late in the day? Well, what I'm really reading there is uh, sleep hygiene. And sleep hygiene is very important, and it, it involves developing a pattern and ritual for your sleep, going to bed at the same time each night, not having any electronic devices at the bedside, turning the television off, and it does take practice. Um, you know, I stop eating after eight o'clock, um, so maybe that would be something helpful to do, but I am excited that you have an abundance of energy and that it just gives you so much vim and vigor, and that, that's a happy thing. Um, in uh, both Dr. Monica Agarwal in her book, Body on Fire, and Dr. Sarai Stancic in her book, What's Missing from Medicine, they each discuss the importance of sleep hygiene and developing good patterns. If you have a Fitbit, 
uh, following your sleep patterns is a very good thing. Hopefully you're not ingesting coffee or caffeinated teas after a certain time. Uh, I would take a whole picture of everything that you ingest, not just the greens. Thanks for the great question. Hey, Sally M, how do you improvise, compensate for a no salt, no fat, no oil, vegan, whole foods diet? Well, I think that it goes back to looking at some of the things that Ann and Jane discuss in their book. And, um, you know, letting your palate, making your palate welcome to new flavors. I, uh, when I became uh, plant-based, on September 23rd, 2009, I was only going to eat this way for 30 days because I thought, oh my God, how in the world am I ever gonna live without salt and um, uh, animal products? And the reality is that after 10 days, I felt remarkably so much better that I made that connection that food is medicine. But fresh herbs, fresh spices, um, you know, uh, granulated garlic and granulated onion powder are two of my best friends. Uh, having a windowsill herb garden is very helpful. And, uh, you know, nutritional yeast uh, doesn't get spoken of highly enough, but it certainly does um, create a nice texture and aroma to your food. So just keep plugging along. Oh, this was a great question. Uh, this is from Anna. Anna lives in Argentina, and she was wondering uh, where she can access difficult to find ingredients, such as arrowroot, vegan butter, white miso, lucuma, safflower oil, just to name a few. Um, this is a great question, and it's something that we're presently working on for our international students so that they will have access to and also ways to develop uh, alternatives to uh, ingredients. So. Stay tuned. If you have any questions, Anna, you can always email me directly, char at ruby.com. Thank you so much for that great question. Um, this is from Raina Babette. Uh, she's got large tomatoes in her garden and she wants to try roasting them. I saw one recipe where they were roasted slices. Is this what I should do or is there another way? So I think I remember uh, in the dehydration uh, unit, uh, they showed you how to dehydrate tomatoes on a low uh, flame in your oven. And uh, if you dehydrate them, you have these beautiful uh, sort of round planks of tomatoes that you can put on top of pizzas if you have a food dehydrator. Um, I have a food dehydrator. I have an Excalibur. I bought it secondhand. I met a lady in a parking lot of a Walmart and I paid $50 for it and it has paid for itself over and over. So uh, maybe looking into a food dehydrator, but you will love having that uh, fresh flavor of the dried tomatoes in the winter. So find a way to do that low flame, like as low as your oven goes and it will take a while. Also, I would put them on parchment paper if you're using your oven so they don't stick when they're totally dry. Good question. Oh, hello, Laura. Uh, where might I find a delicious recipe for air fried cauliflower? Oh, yes. I love air fried cauliflower. Uh, sometimes I just put things, I just throw things together. Uh, my grandparents were Italian chefs and I grew up, uh, my playground was the back of the house as they say in the restaurant business. So oftentimes I'll just throw things together. I believe I used a batter and uh, I think I used um, maybe garbanzo bean flour with a lot of spices. There was, there's always garlic and onion in some things. That's why I don't have high blood pressure because I eat so much garlic. Um, I think I can send it to you though, Laura. Very good question. Also, I love an air fryer. Um, I have a couple of them. And I find them quick and easy. And if you don't want to heat up the whole house, an air fryer is the way to go. Very good question. Thank you, Laura. Uh, this is from Tara Lynn. I heard you guys use a Blixer food processor by Roboku. It's pretty expensive. Is there a less expensive one that still has a bowl scraper? Well, first, let me just show you one thing. Because I have um, a fancy schmancy... Um, Cuisinart 
and I got it at a culinary store here in Philadelphia called Fonte's. It's the oldest cooking supply store in America. It's, I would say for lack of anything, it's a, uh, an urban uh, Williams and Sonoma founded um, more than 100 years ago by the Fonte family. And if you've been to Philadelphia, it has to be on your tour list. But I just want to show you this. This is made by Tupperware. It's a handheld food chopper. You put your ingredients in and then you pull. Sorry for that noise. And it makes incredible, incredible whatever you need to puree or chop it works really well so i can tell you that i don't have a roboku i have a um uh, a cuisinart that i love and i bought it from a reputable store where someone could explain to me everything that i needed to know so uh on the day that i decided i needed a new food processor i went to kohl's and i went to ask someone a question and realized that I need to go to Fonte's. And so I drove to Fonte's and not only did they answer every question, they also carried that big gigantic box to my car, which was several blocks away. So uh, look into, there are some Cuisinart models that will do the same thing um, that also do have a bowl scraper. Um, I have um, a, uh, oh gosh, what brand is it? I have a countertop mixer that has a great blender in it and I, I want to tell you that I won it in a contest on Instagram. So um, I can tell you, Tara Lynn, uh, next time I see one of your assignments or I'll email you and let you know which brand it is. But that's a great question. But this Tupperware thing, I want to say one more thing about it. It comes in multiple sizes. Um, there are knockoffs of them that are made of cheap plastic and will die in two minutes. So um, it just has the Tupperware logo on it, but it works beautifully. Thanks for that question. This is from uh, Dobadi. Can you elaborate umami a little bit because we are having difficulty understanding how exactly umami tastes. It is a combination of four other tastes or something completely different. This is an emotional question because I find umami to be uh, almost, um, you know, it's sort of like, for me, it's the fifth of the flavors of the umami. It's the enjoyment factor. It's what you like. It's how it feels. It's how it tastes. But I don't know if I can give you the, the best answer to that. But that's a great question. Um, oh, this is back to Raina again. Hold on a second. I have larger tomatoes in my garden that I would like to try roasting. I saw Okay, we already answered Raina's question, I believe. Um, okay, let's see. We're doing good. We're doing well on time. What is the best way to cook without oil? This is from Sue M. I try dry and burn everything I add water and my dish comes out soggy. Um... You know, no oil saute is a skill. And it depends on many things, including even heat, uh, the heat distribution. Uh, I always suggest to students to do the mercury water test. It only works in stainless steel pans, so that's a good reason to maybe get a stainless steel pan. And I think that patience is the other thing. Uh, you know, oftentimes we cook by sound and we might be used to that sizzle, sizzle, crack, crack of using oil and we don't hear that. So moving things around uh, in the skillet helps. And I think practice, I think I would freak out if I used oil today. Plus, a lot of you tell me this when you do the no oil saute, that food tastes better because the oil doesn't create that layer that sort of creates an illusion for what food should really taste like. So my answer to that question is to keep practicing. And um, zucchini, mushroom, eggplant work really, really well. If you're trying, I, you know, I don't know what exactly it is that you're trying to know oil saute. If you put too much water in, it's going to come out as though 
um, it's going to have a watery, saturated flavor. So you want to, you know, keep a little jar next to your stove and, you know, at increments in, in like 30 cc's at a time of an amount. Hope that helps. Um, oh, hi, Daniel. What are some of your favorite recipes for serving at a home dinner party? Well, first, I'm going to tell you that it's been a while since I've had a dinner party. But, um, you know, the recipes uh, or the assignment for the uh, canapé party, also known as the shindig party, um, are just being creative. So last week, I was working on a mustard recipe. And I took some cookie cutters and cut out some... Uh, uh, Mesterbacher pumpernickel bread and made them into rounds. And then I made a uh, tofu cream cheese that had no oil in it, but it was really good. And then I put some slivered carrots on it. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty simple cook. Uh, I like a good potato bar with different sauces. I like a, a little, uh, you know, bite of a salad. Um, uh, I made truffles last week. I decorated them with them. Um, beet powder for color. So things that are simple and nutrient dense, but nothing very fancy, you know, as they say, uh, less is more. Um, but invite me to your house, Daniel. I don't know where you live, but invite me to your house and let me taste your delicious cooking. Uh, since this is again from Julie Z, since I love the sort of Tom blender so much. Uh, could you recommend a regular spatula too? I had a good cook one for years, but unable to find one again. You know, I have a spatula that I got at um, some discount store, and I don't even know the name of it. But um, a good spatula is kind of like a good pair of shoes that fit beautifully. Once you find it, you'll kind of know. So I can't answer your question. But it is a very good question. This is from Adolf B. Hi, Chef Char. I successfully worked the Mercury bubble exercise. However, this might be a transitory moment regarding pan neatness. Should I lower the heat to stabilize the temperature or will it happen normally with the addition of food? Thank you. So am I to understand that you... Um, uh, sauteed uh, your aromatics and then you're adding more food to it. Personally, myself, I like to keep the flame where it is. Uh, magically, things just seem to happen. And the other reason why I do that is that I don't have to remember one more thing because I have burned things previously by adding too much heat and then forgetting that I did that and then ruining the flavor. So I personally, my own technique is to keep the flame where it is. All right, hope that helps. And it looks like we are almost done. Let me see. I have a couple of more show and tell things here. So hold on one second. Um, save your bottles when you buy bottled herbs, especially the glass ones. Uh, not only do they make really adorable little vases for flowers and things like that, but if you buy your spices in bulk, then you have the perfect place to store them. Uh, what I recommend for the bottom is to take a Sharpie marker and write the date of purchase so that um, in 2024, when you wonder why your dish doesn't taste good, it's because you used garlic powder from 2021. So always label the bottom with a marker. That also helps. And um, let's see. Oh, back to photos for one second. <clears throat> so you all know that a white plate creates the best background for showing your food. Um, this is from the dollar store. A dollar. Um, dollar store. A dollar. And uh, you want a white plate because you don't want a busy pattern that occludes the beauty of the dish that you've made. And um, I didn't bring one upstairs, but I have a backdrop that I made for pictures and it's two 18 inch tiles that I got at uh, Lowe's and I smacked them together and flipped them when I need to have a different background. 
However, uh, this is a beautiful linen um, dish towel, I guess. And if I were cooking a dish that had onions in it or something, it would be beautiful. So you've got a little color and a little distraction, but your food is still going to stand out on that white plate. So white plates are where it is at. Um, what is a good stainless steel starter set? I'm going to say Cuisinart. It's what I use on the trolley cart, and they cook beautifully. Also, um, um, Kefalot is another good brand. Just a funny story. When I worked at Whole Foods Market for 10 years, and um, <clears throat> I was the marketing team leader for my store, and so I'd go out to events, you know, sort of like be the mayor for Whole Foods. And uh, I got a, rec a, a, a question to please come to an event, a request to come to an event. And I thought that it was at the Pot and Pan Company, and I was so excited to go. And when I got there, it was a pharmaceutical company whose name was almost identical. And I remember feeling very, very let down that I wasn't at the pot and pan company. Uh, can I freeze cubed sweet potatoes and white potatoes so that I can save time to make additional meals with them? Um, yeah, you, you can freeze anything. I think that's a good idea uh, to puree them. I would puree them in um, um, portion sizes. Uh, or put them into ice cube trays. Uh, I have done that on uh, uh, time to time. The texture might change a little bit, but you can adjust it by adding a little nutritional yeast because remember when you freeze, there's going to be more moisture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, very good question. And I think I saw a question about an air fryer. So I've had several. Um, some of the uh, brands that I that I have used, um, there's a mini one by a company called Dash, D-A-S-H. It doesn't have any bells and whistles on it. It's done all with dials. Um, and I like dials, so there isn't anything electronic that's going to break or go wrong. Uh, the Dash is a three and a half quart size. It's perfect for one or two people, makes wonderful. Um, French fries, you can bake it, you can do anything in, in that. I've often baked, I have even baked in the dash. Um, but about, uh, I don't know, two or three years ago, my kitchen counter was starting to look like uh, uh, BJ's because I had so many appliances. So I consolidated and got the Cuisinart. Um, it's a toaster oven, it's an oven, it's an air fryer, it's a convection stove, uh, and a toaster. And uh, it works beautifully. And again, I did not buy the one with the LCD readouts. I just got one that had dials. On the Charlie cart, uh, I use the Breville, B-R-E-V-I-L-L-E. -E, and that is also a combo. It does everything that you need to do. It's a little bit bigger cubic foot wise than the Cuisinart, but those two would be my favorite. Don't succumb to the infomercials where um, Emeril Lagasse is like, you know, roasting a chicken and doing all of this stuff because they have a lot of technology to them. And I think that uh, simple is, um, is best. And uh, it looks like we're coming to an end. I'm looking at all of my show and tell. Um, one thing I did want to show you, and I have several of these. Um, this is a kale stripper. You can kale, you can strip kale, but for the teeny weeny holes, you can also strip herbs. To strip herbs, you can also use a fork. So, but this is a fun thing uh, to have. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with uh, a couple of uh, thoughts. I, I think I saw a question and maybe it didn't make it to the top to the list, but when you are preparing to do your assignments, um, say on a Sunday night, look at your coursework and see what you're going to make. And uh, look at the ingredient list and see things that have similar ingredients. So this way you only have to make one stop at the grocery store make a list, check it twice, and um, go from there so that you have what you need. I am cognizant of the fact that grocery shopping, the fabric of grocery shopping has changed drastically since March of 2020. And um, 
It takes a little bit longer sometimes to find things, but that patience uh, will yield a beautiful dish at the end. And I leave you with this, you know, Ken Rubin, who is our marvelous, marvelous uh, leader, uh, always says to have fun, always says happy cooking. And I want to add one more thing. Please have fun when you cook. Have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing your, assi seeing your assignments soon. And thank you so much for joining me today. Happy Tuesday.